Church on the Rise would like to welcome you to the Ministry of the Word. We pray that it will help you find the Word of God more clearly in your life. Are you ready for the Word this morning? Ready for the Word of God? Well, I've got a real great sense of expectation. You know that any time that we would open the Word, whether at home or whether together here at church, we should expect change. We should expect life. We should expect an encounter to God, an encounter with God. You know, these just aren't black and white dead words on a page this morning. They are life himself. Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It goes on to say that he clothed himself in flesh and he now dwells with us. The Message Bible says that he's moved in to the neighborhood. Uh, aren't you glad that it's not just a hope But we have a living hope. It's a living word. The word is active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide between joint and marrow. It is the discerner and the judger of the thoughts and the intent of mankind. It's a living word this morning. And I have a great sense of expectation and faith that if we give God the next few moments, that something would shift in each and every single one of our lives as we come around the living and active word. Amen. Amen? Amen. Come on. The louder you cheer, the faster I go. I want to talk with you today on the topic or around the subject on persistence and perseverance. There is great power, there is great reward in our persistence and perseverance. To quote the great Dory from Finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. There is great power and there is great reward to be found in our persistence and perseverance. You don't have to go far down the journey of life to recognize that life doesn't play fair. It's a bit nasty sometimes, nasty surprises around the corner. Life doesn't play fair. It hurts sometimes. It's hard sometimes. And to be able to live through it, and not just through it, to be able to live above it, and beyond the trials and tribulations of life requires that we would have great levels of perseverance and persistence in our lives to be able to get through and to get beyond. Unfortunately, for many in Christendom, we may have believed that Jesus would eradicate for us here on earth all pain, all trial, and all testing of our faith. But experientially, we know that to not be true. But more than experientially, the word shows us for, in fact, the opposite of this is true. It's an exciting message this morning. You're all excited about this, getting promised that there's going to be trial. Jesus' brother James said this. I think the, the, the scripture's going up on the screen this morning. Consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy. Pure joy. It's not just joy. I think I shared about this a couple of weeks ago. Look at the words there. Consider it pure joy. Not not just consider it joy. Consider it pure joy. I don't think we've got the picture quite right. When I think about this scripture, I think we need to kind of get a little bit of something going. Consider it pure joy. (laughs) Woohoo! Pure joy. Are you reading what I'm reading there? Are we seeing the same things? Consider it pure joy. Uh, What, James? What should we consider pure joy? Whenever you face trials. That's right. Hey, come on. Don't go getting ahead of me. you're You're stealing my material. Of many kinds. Not just some kinds. Not just some things, but of many kinds. Consider it pure joy. Because what? Why, James? Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and here it is let perseverance finish its work why James why should we consider it all joy why should we why should we persevere James gets to it here let it run its course and I love the language used here too it says let it it's not like you need to do anything other than just stay out of the way let it run its course don't abort don't jump off don't get off it let perseverance run its course so that, so that what? So that we may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
So there's a purpose. There's a reason why we can consider it pure joy. It's not because James is a sadist. It's not because God looks down upon our hardships with some sense of enjoyment. He's a good dad and he wants our best. So there's a purpose to our pain. There's a purpose to our trials. See, Jesus is not just found in the absence of trial. He's found right in the middle of trial, right in the middle of tribulation, right in the middle of our mess. I'm glad that we serve a Jesus, that I know a Jesus who's found right in my boat in the middle of the storm. He's not a God that's found in the absence of the storm, but no, in the middle of the storm, when I find myself in places of unrest, of trial and tribulation, I find that my Jesus is in the boat there with me. He doesn't want us to run from trial and tribulation. He would desire that we would run to him and draw closer to him in the middle of trials and tribulations in our lives. There is a purpose, however, a why to our perseverance. James says, this is the purpose to be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia and he penned these words in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary. Is anybody weary here this morning? I'm a little bit weary. It's at the end of a year we find ourselves, you know, we just, I don't know what it is. There's nothing special about a calendar year. There's no extra refreshment necessarily at the end of December, but we can all look to the end of the year's nearly here and, You know, we become a little bit weary, a little bit battle-worn, or at the end of a a stressful season in life, at the end of an emotional event, we can become weary, and life has a way of slowly eroding away at our strength and sometimes at our soul. But Paul here encourages, let us not become weary in doing good. Why? For at the proper time, everyone say the proper time, There's a proper time. That's why we need perseverance. Might not be today, but God promises that it is coming. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if if we do not give up. If we stay on course, if we stay on track, if we do what James encourages us to let it run its work, let it run its course and stay on track. The power in our persistence and perseverance is twofold. Firstly, it can get us through, and secondly, it can get us to. It can get us through trial, through pain, through immaturity, through difficulty. It can get us to maturity, to the other side of trial, to our promises in God, to our our best in Him, to our futures that He has spoken over us. There is great purpose, great power and great reward in our persistence and perseverance. The Gospel of Luke records the parable that Jesus told that my Bible titles the parable of the persistent widow. It's found in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither neither feared God nor cared about what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about what people think, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they will get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes... Will he find such faith on earth? 
Sometimes when we read different passages of Scripture, we can be unclear initially as to what the author is getting at. What are they really trying to say? How is this applicable to my life? Uh, how does this play out? How do I put legs on this? But, but not in this particular Scripture. See, Jesus right from the get-go outlines why he's telling this story and what is the purpose of his illustration. Jesus says, I'm about to tell you a story because I want to illustrate this point. That you should always pray and never give up. I'm giving you this illustration. I'm giving you this picture of persistence, of this continual knocking at, this continual coming at, this just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. I'm giving you this picture so that you will understand that no matter what you're facing, never give up and don't stop praying. Jesus said there's power in your persistence. There's a power in you sticking at it. There's a power in you being consistent. There's a reward. There's a payoff. There's a prize if we can just stay the course. I remember when Kelly and I first met, totally enamored, to completely smitten. There were feelings of how amazing is this person? They're so completely in love with Jesus, sold out and a little bit cute to boot. At first, there was a bit of resistance, a bit of reluctance, but that did not discourage. There was persistence and perseverance, and it eventually paid off. I finally caved to Kelly's persistent pursuit of me. <laughs> and what a prize, what a prize it was. There was power in Kelly's persistence. There is great reward in our persistence. I think life gives us many great examples of what persistence looks like. But I think there is no greater example, no greater picture in life for us than that which we see in children. They are undoubtedly, unequivocally, unmistakably the kings and queens of persistence. No one taught them this gift. They're just born with it. It's written in their genetic code somewhere. It's intuitive. They just get it and they get it right from the get-go. These cute little people. We saw them. One minute so adorable. So sweet. The next minute striking terror into unsuspecting parents everywhere, especially in shopping centers. Mum, can I have a lollipop? No, sweetie, not today. Please, 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 please. Can I have... No, darling, not today. You've had enough. Oh, come on, please. No. Please, mum, please, mum, please, mum. I'll be good. I promise I'll be good. No, sweetie, not today. You cannot have a lollipop. And then the kid starts kicking <laughs> and starts screaming louder and louder. Their head starts spinning 360s. Some demonic force has overtaken this child. Their eyes roll back into their head and this ungodly voice comes out, I want a lollipop. <laughs> We've all seen it. Maybe they were your kids that I saw to get this example. I don't know. But finally beat down, emotionally depleted, stripped of all dignity and strength. Every ounce of self-respect crushed. Mum and dad finally succumb to the demands of this little Hitler. <laughs> yes, my dear, you can have a lollipop. But it's true, isn't it? These little terrorists of terror striking fear into parents. Our children are not too dissimilar. Uh, they're not here now, which is fantastic. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unrelenting. It's, it's, I, I compare it to Chinese water torture. It's this continual dripping and eroding away of strength, this, this persistence. Can I have? Can I have? And eventually, you know, I'm just throwing my wallet at them, the car keys. My eldest is only 13. I'm, I'm giving them the mortgage to the house. Like, just take whatever, please. We just, if you stop, you can have whatever you want. There is power in our persistence. Remember what Jesus said in his parable about the unrighteous judge. Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. 
Our persistence and perseverance has great reward. It can get us through and it can get us to. The story of the life of Joseph that we find in Genesis chapter 37, I think, paints so powerfully and so poignantly the power of persistence and perseverance in somebody's life. The power of sticking at it, of not giving up in such trying circumstances. I mean, circumstances that are the exact opposite of everything God said Joseph was to experience. And yet we find Joseph consistent in character and steadfast in conviction. God gave Joseph a clear picture of his future. However, for so long, for so long, everything Joseph saw and experienced was everything but what God had shown him. Joe was about 17 years old when God gave him a dream. And he was mummy and daddy's favorite little boy. He was a mummy's boy. He was a daddy's boy. And daddy decided to make him a little coat, a little rainbow coat for little Joey. And he was the favorite, favorite little boy. And funnily enough, Joseph and his brothers didn't think much of this, of his, his favoritism. Oh, it's a bit strange to strike you. It was odd that uh, his brothers didn't like. But his brothers didn't like his dreams either. Um, you know, once again, a little bit hard to understand. You know, it's funny how siblings don't appreciate being told that one day you're going to bow down before me. You know, how would that go around Christmas, around the Christmas table? You know, hey guys, just letting you know, had a dream this year, you know, this time next year, well, you know, you're all going to be bowing down before me. But uh, so I can't possibly imagine why his brothers may have had a problem with that. But up until this point, life was pretty good for Joe. He was the favorite son. He had his pimped out jacket. He had a God-given dream, a huge dream, a big dream, a dream of a great future in God. Joe was large and in charge. Everything was awesome. Life was so good, you'd often hear Joseph singing the theme song to the Lego movie. So you think it started with the Lego movie. No, it started with Joseph. Everything was awesome. Joe was going around singing everything was awesome. For those of us that are a bit older that have no idea what I'm talking about, maybe he was singing Katrina and the Waves, I'm Walking on Sunshine. Does everybody know? No, we've, got, we've got the feel. Joe's happy. Everything's good. Everything's going good for Joseph. But no matter which song it was, this is how Joseph was. Everything was good. But it's right here Joseph's life starts to take a drastic turn for the worst. His brothers are so ticked with his favoritism, his special coat and his dreams of superiority that they think, oh, we're just going gonna, gonna to kill you. That's how much we think of your dreams, mate. We're going we're gonna to kill you. And uh, lucky for Reuben. Everyone say, thanks, Reuben. That he had a little bit of common sense and went, maybe it's we're taking it just a little bit of a step too far. Let's just throw him into that hole over there, make out like he's dead. And then they decide to sell him to a band of foreign slave traders. Now, I don't know how life, how bad life may have gotten for you, but I'm pretty sure none of you have been sold into slavery by your brothers and sisters. Or at least I hope not. But this is where Joseph was at. He had gone from top dog to underdog. He'd gone from singing Everything is Awesome to singing, What about me? It isn't fair. He gets pushed around, knocked to the ground. He gets to his feet and he says, Come on, church. What about me? What about me? It isn't fair. Everything is not awesome. Everything is bad. And everything is real bad. I find that life can be like this sometimes. Everything starts out good with so much promise. A new job. Oh, it's so good. The people are great. I think it's going to be an amazing job. It's all favorites and colored coats and dreams. Hello, young man. Good on you. You can have that. Marriage can sometimes start out like this. Oh, he completes me. It's like we finish each other's sentences. We're so in sync. I never knew life could be this good. <laughs> Holding hands and skipping through the park. It's rainbows and butterflies and colored coats and dreams. It's all wonderful. 
But then a year or two down the track, maybe for some a week or two, it's, she's so annoying. If he tries to finish my sentence one more time, I'll seriously knock him out. Hole, I'll throw you in a hole. I will end you. Now, that's not Kelly's in my experience. I've heard stories. I've heard stories, times of counselling with people. It's not my experience. But when we first come to faith and give our lives to Jesus, everything is good. Forgiveness, new life, redemption. Acceptance, release, relationship, connection to God. Bondages are broken and there is freedom. We become God's favourite and we are. We all are. He puts a colourful coat on us. He dresses us in life, clothes us in him, and he gives us a dream. He gives us a picture of a future in him, and everything is awesome. And it's like nothing could or ever will go wrong until it does, until it does. But the same God who gave you the coat, the same God who gave you the dream is the same God that's with you in the hole. He's the God that doesn't leave us or forsake us. He's always with us. As you look through the life of Joseph, the the scripture outlines, as Moses records in the story of Joseph, that it says that when he was in Pharaoh's house, God was with him. When he was in Potiphar's house, God was with him. But it also says this, when he was in prison, God was with him. God was with him through the ups and the downs. He is the God who is with us in our holes, as it were. And God says to us, don't become weary in doing good. Hold on. Stay the course. For at the proper time, there's a proper time. Don't go getting ahead of the time of God in your life. We will. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. There's a promise. There is a reward if you persist and if you persevere, if you hold fast to your convictions and stay consistent in your character. This is not the end of you. This is the making of you. But you can't jump off early. You have to ride it out. James encourages us, let it finish its work. Let it play out. Let it go. Walk with God in it and you will be mature, complete, not lacking anything. Jesus told his disciples a parable. Why? Why did he tell them this story? To show them that they should always pray and never give up. There is power in our persistence and perseverance to get us through and to get us to. The Apostle Paul was a man who knew what it was to persevere. And he wrote this in his second letter to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we had felt we'd received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. What an amazing picture. An amazing picture of persistence and perseverance under extreme and great pressure. Have you ever felt under pressure? Been in situations and circumstances that you just felt like you were way, way out of your depth. That it was way over your head overwhelmed by your inability to endure at work in relationships finances maybe in the areas of your soul depression anxiety fear despondency a loss of hope have you ever said these words or thought these words i can't do this anymore i can't go on like this this is too much this is killing me i i i cannot endure I am completely overwhelmed. This is beyond me. I have no clue where to go, what to do, or how to move forward. This is where Paul was, overwhelmed. 
beyond, he says, our ability to endure. And we thought we weren't going to live through it. In fact, we expected to die. I don't know if any of you are feeling like that today, but I know that we've all felt similar feelings to this at one point or another in our lives. We've all experienced the emotions of feeling like this is too much. I can't go on. But Paul goes on to say, and herein lies the key. Here's the lesson. Here's the crux of it all. But this happened, Paul says. Why? That we might not rely on ourselves, but on the God who raises the dead. Persistence and perseverance isn't about more effort on your part. It's about more trust in his ability to get us through. That we might not rely on our strengths, on our energies, on our abilities, but we might rely on the God who raises the dead. Why? Why is a sad question to ask, isn't it? Why me? Why now? Why this? Oh, this happened that we might not rely upon ourselves, but on the God who raises the dead. If you hold fast, if you persist, if you hold up under pressure, I will deliver you. Paul says he has delivered us from such a deadly peril. He is delivering us and he, uh, we set our hope on him that he will continue to deliver us. There's a past, a present and a future deliverance promised to us in God. But all this happens so that we would rely on and set our hope on the God who would bring us through, on the God who would deliver us. There is great power, great reward in your persistence and perseverance. But back to Joe. Joe's journey doesn't finish there. It continues on, the, the highs and the lows, the good and the bad. From everything is awesome to slavery. From slavery to Potiphar's house, to favour, to accusation and prison. And finally from prison, he finds himself standing in front of the world's most powerful king at the time, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph goes through all of that and now is standing in front of Pharaoh and he's asked to interpret his dream and this is Joseph's response. I cannot do it. Where's, where's Joe with all his bravado and coat and telling everybody his dreams and how good he is? Where's that Joe gone? See, something's changed in Joseph over the course of time. Joseph says this to Pharaoh, I can't do it, but God can and God will. It's not me, it's him. Something had changed in Joseph. He, like Paul, could now say that all of this happened in my life, all of that back there, so that I would learn not to rely upon myself, but I would learn to rely upon the God who raises the dead. And at the end of the, this story in Genesis, chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph says this amazing statement that you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. There's a plan, there's a reward, there's power in our perseverance and persistence. All of this happened so I would set my hope not on myself, but on the God who has delivered, who is delivering, who will continue to deliver. God didn't cause it, but God's wanting to use it to form maturity. James says that we may be mature, complete, and lacking nothing. The same God who gives us the dream is the same God who's with us in the prison. If I could have the worship team up, that would be great. The writer of Hebrews wrote this encouragement in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 to 36. So don't throw away your confidence. Don't, don't throw it away. So there's a confidence that's been given to us that we have that we can just throw away. And this morning as I was up early just praying through the message and what I believe God was wanting to say to us today, I believe that there's people here today and you've, you've thrown away your confidence. You've thrown away a confidence in a call of God that's upon your life. You've thrown away your confidence in believing God's best in a relationship. You've just thrown it away, but the writer of Hebrews is encouraging us here. Don't, don't throw away your confidence for it will be richly rewarded. There, there's a reward. Don't, don't, don't throw it away. 
Grab a hold of it. Grab back a hold of what God's spoken over your life. Grab a hold of the promises of God. Grab a hold of his word again and begin to declare them. Don't throw away your confidence for it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. Here's that annoying word again. Persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. There's a reward at the end of our perseverance. There's the promises of God. There is great power to get us through trial and the testing of our faith and dreams, to get us to our promise, to get us to God. There is a purpose in the pain. Christianity's not come to God and everything is awesome. Christianity's come to God because He is awesome. He never fails. He's the rock. He's the stability. He's the one where the righteous can run and are safe. Under His wing we find shelter for the storms of life. Christianity isn't come and all your trials and troubles will be eradicated. No, it's come to Him and even though trouble is guaranteed, it's promised. Jesus says you, you're going to experience it. God wants to use that to turn it around for his good and for our good so that we might learn not to rely upon ourselves but learn to rely upon him the God who raises the dead he has delivered us he is delivering us and he is yet to continue to deliver us God wants to guide us through to receive what he has promised from the persistent widow to James to Joseph, to Paul. God is showing us that there is a great reward in our persistence and perseverance. Church, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You need to persevere to receive the reward. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Today, I know that there are some here that have grown weary in doing good, given up on persisting, on persevering, on getting through, given up maybe in things in our character, flaws, and we've just, I'm just never going to get beyond this. This is just who I am. Given up on maturity, our relationships, our call, or God's promises, saying it's too hard, it's overwhelming. But I want to encourage you this morning, there's a great reward in our persistence. Don't grow weary. Let perseverance complete its work. Don't abort. Don't jump off. Stay on track. Keep at it. God's walking beside you. The same God who calls is the same God that's with us in the challenges of life. Jesus says, pray always. Don't give up. I encourage you to stand together as we just finish this morning's message. I don't know who you are or where you are at or what you've given up on or what you're feeling weary with this morning. But as we worship today, as we're just going to lift our voice and worship to God, we have an opportunity to call upon the God who wants to empower us and equip us with an ability to persevere. This doesn't require more effort from you. It just requires more reliance upon Him. This is not a works program. This is for us to not whip it up. But this is for us just to lay it all down afresh and anew before Him. There's a God who wants to empower and to equip you to be able to persist and persevere. Whatever you are facing right now, it's not your end. It's your making. It's not a full stop. It's a dash. There's the end to the story because God promises us that if we stay on track, we will receive the promise. Victory is guaranteed for us when we walk with Him. So this morning as the worship team begins to sing, I just want to encourage you in this moment to reflect upon the the weights of life that are wearying you, that are pulling at you. Maybe it's finances, maybe it's healing, it's relational pressures and stress. Maybe you've thrown away your confidence. But in this moment, 
the few moments that we've got left this morning, that you would call to mind and draw upon His strength, draw upon His refreshing, draw upon the Holy Spirit's equipping and empowerment this morning. God, we thank You for Your amazing, undeserved, unmerited grace upon us. For it is Your grace that gives us the ability to stand up in You, Lord God, to persevere and to persist. And this morning, I pray, Lord God, that Your Word will have found good soil, that it will bring forth much fruit this morning, Lord God, in the lives of Your people. But just before we finish this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't want to miss an opportunity. If you're here this morning and you've never really invited God or Jesus into your life or into your heart. It's not something that you've pursued or sought out, but as you've been sitting here this morning, something stirred in your heart. That's that's the Holy Spirit touching your life. That's the presence of God. And as I've been speaking, something has been stirring in you, and today you'd like to make a decision to invite Jesus into your life with every head bowed and every eye closed, with no one looking around. If that's you this morning, and you say, I, I don't know about this God thing. I, I, I don't know if I died today where I would end up. I, I, don't, I don't know, but there's something of the presence of God here today, and I want to respond. If, if that's you today, just lift your hand. I'll see it. I just want to know who I'm praying with. You can pull it down. So give everybody an opportunity here this morning. If that's you, nobody's looking around. Just lift your hand. I'll see it. Thank you. I see that hand. Is there anybody else here this morning? Just lift your hand, I'll see it. So I know who I'm praying with this morning. Fantastic. Father God, we just thank you for this surrendered life over here. And we pray this morning, Lord God, and we thank you that you sent your son to die upon a cross for us so that we might be able to walk in the freedom that you purchased. We come to you as sinners in need of repentance. And ask for your forgiveness, Jesus, to come and wash over us this morning. And we invite you, Lord Jesus, into our hearts to take up residence, to be not only Saviour, but we declare you as Lord of our lives now. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Let's give God a hand of praise in this place this morning. We trust you've enjoyed the ministry of the Word. And if you'd like more details or how to contact our church and its resources, look at our website www.churchontherise.org.au.